Hello. Ah. High grade 3 dysplastic spondylolysis in a young patient. The debate starts. Opening remarks with, by Dr. K.B. Menon. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. So, so far you've been hearing talks about uh, minimally invasive surgery, endoscopic surgery. Uh, this is a paradigm shift. We are going into complete open surgery. So before I start, let me just ask you a question. Uh, I've just put up two cases here. Do you have a pointer there? This is a pointer, I think. Uh, are both these cases the same? Both are 50% slips. Both have got past defects. Are the same? You don't have to answer. Just think about it in your mind. That's enough. OK? The next question is, here are two other slips. Both are high-grade, high-dysplastic slips. Can both be treated the same way? Just think about it. Don't answer it. Think about it. It is important for you to keep this in your mind. Uh, so I'll be talking about high-grade, high-dysplastic surgery and why I prefer open surgery. The honest answer is I don't know how to do any minimal access surgery. That's why I do open surgery. But uh, my logic, my rationale for doing open surgery is this. I have no disclosures. In this lecture, I'll take you through what is surgical morbidity related to access morbidity and target organ morbidity. Remember that the goal of all surgery is the same, whether it is minimal access or open surgery, the target organ procedure that you do is going to be exactly the same in most instances. That's what I'm going to highlight. And in spondylolisthesis, particularly high-grade, high-dysplastic spondylolisthesis, the end point is fusion. So remember that I'm going to bring this up again and again. And I'll also tell you that the surgical strategy, just because it's a high-grade listhesis, don't, don't think that all high-grade listhesis are the same. It's a whole spectrum of disorders. There are different surgical strategies for this. And I'll bring up the SDSG classification and the three surgical strategies that we have. I'll also touch upon the literature in support of MIS surgery. Remember, I'm not arguing against MIS surgery. I'm only arguing in favor of open surgery. And this is why. Surgical morbidity, gentlemen, are of two types. One is access-related morbidity. The other is target organ morbidity. So what you do on the target organ, for example, if it's an appendicectomy or a thyroidectomy, you probably cannot change at all. You still have to remove the appendix, or you still have to remove the thyroid. But the access-related morbidity, you can substantially modify by your minimal access technique. But sometimes, this also varies, as I'll explain in a minute. Now, remember, there's an important paper by Roger Hartle and his team. He says, the goal of MIS is to leave the smallest possible surgical footprint while achieving, the most important thing, the goal of the traditional open surgery. The target organ procedure that you do has to remain constant. You have to take out the appendix, you have to take out the thyroid or whatever else you are aiming to do, or the gallbladder, but your access can be modified, your footprint can be modified. So uh, again, uh, Roger Hartle's paper, the MIS surgery, he says, has got four principles. The most important is the patient selection. Every patient is not a good candidate for MIS surgery. In some situations, in low dysplastic, low grade listers, you saw that you can perhaps perform it across the spectrum. Uh, you need a very large theater setting or, or a fairly advanced theater setting. O arms, navigation, image intensification, et cetera, et cetera. You need a surgeon with meticulous technique and adequate training to perform these surgeries. I'll just bring out two examples where MIS surgery has been extremely successful and extremely uh, extreme failure. Arthroscopic surgery of the knee and the shoulder has replaced conventional knee surgery completely. So it, it can access the posterior part of the knee joint. You can access, uh, you can perform PCL uh, revisions, you can do meniscal repairs, many of the things that we could not do with a conventional open surgery of the knee, you can today perform arthroscopically. So knee and shoulder arthroscopy has been spectacularly successful. But what about endoscopic carpal tunnel release? It's crazy if any of you still do endoscopic carpal tunnel release because the benefit of doing an open surgery far outweighs the benefit of doing an endoscopic release. The technology, the investment in time, money, learning curve that each of you as surgeons put in must have substantial benefit to the surgeon or the patient, otherwise that technology is not going to sustain itself. And that's precisely why endoscopic carpal tunnel release has faded away. 
Let's come back to high-grade spondylolisthesis. Now remember, in a high-grade spondylolisthesis, fusion is the end point of all your surgery. In a low-grade listhesis, I have seen some papers being presented here that people get away with just uh, uh, stenosis release, foraminal release, that's fine. In low-grade listhesis, but in high-grade, high-dysplastic listhesis, remember, fusion is the end point of all your surgeries. The surgical strategies are broadly divided into three. I have put them as three. One is in situ fixation and fusion. There are several ways of doing it. There's a delta configuration, there's a Ballman technique, there's a Kellogg speed technique, and there's a sacroplasty technique, which we were doing some 20 years ago. I'm going to show you some examples. There is a short segment reduction technique where you do an L5 S1 spondylolysis reduction and fusion. You have a long segment where you might want to go to L4 uh, or a very long segment where you might want to put temporary screws into L1 as well. There are several techniques. I'll just explain some of them. So how do you select your cases for surgery? Don't think high-grade, high-dysplastic spondylolysis are all alike. They are not. They're simply not alike. Take this classification, for example. I think you're all familiar with this. I don't have to explain this. But when we talk about the SDSG classification and high-grade high listers, you're talking only about type 4, type 5, and type 6. And all three are different animals. They are not treated in the same way. For example, the original authors, Hubert Labelle and Pierre Rossoli, have, have given their strategy the SDSG type 4, where there is no pelvic imbalance and there's no truncal imbalance, you can fuse it in situ. You might choose to reduce it, that's fine. You might use a delta frame configuration, but you can do an in situ fixation. You cannot do, or it's preferable not to do an in situ fixation if you have an SDSG type 5 or an SDSG 6. SDSG type 5, you preferably do a short segment fixation, L5, S1 is adequate. But if you have an SDSG6 where you have truncal imbalance, it is mandatory that you go to L5, L4 at least temporarily, but preferably on a longer duration. I'm going to show you examples for this. And this is precisely my surgical strategy. Why do we do this? Obviously, we are all scared of neurology. Uh, there is, in, in high-grade spondylolysis, there anywhere between 8 to 30 percent neurological deterioration, at least of the exiting nerve, L5 nerve roots, and this is a fairly recent paper, and that's why we would always try and avoid doing that if we can. That's why we do the delta configuration. So the delta configuration has the advantage. I think you all know the delta configuration where you skewer the, the S1 vertebra from posteriorly into the L5 vertebra. You add bone graft. You have to do an interbody fusion. There are several examples of this, various ways of doing it. You still have to clear the disc space. You still have to put bone graft in the disc space because remember the end point, the target organ end point remains the same. That is fusion between L5 and S1. So this can be done for SDSG type 4 alone. Now, there are various ways of doing uh, in, in situ bone grafting. One of the classic techniques is called a Kellogg speed, which I'm going to show you now because we've done this uh, in olden times. We don't do this that often nowadays. So here's a diagrammatic representation. You go anteriorly, resect the lower half of the L5 vertebra, clear the L5 S1 disc space, and you insert the vertebral body as graft into it, and you bang a fibular bone graft. You use, I would normally use a DHS reamer, and over the reamer, I bang a fibular bone graft into it. And this is a classical example of how this is done. Now, remember, if this is done, in this case, is an SDSG type 6. Obviously, if you do it in an unbalanced pelvis or an unbalanced spine, you cannot reorient the spine. The, the, the imbalance, the sagittal plane deformity is not corrected, but you still achieve a fusion. So it was a good technique, and the neurological complications are virtually nil. A similar technique is the Ballman technique, which was, uh, which uh, this is uh, from Dieter Grob's publication. The same thing is done from the back. A fibular graft is banged in from the posterior side. It is supplemented with screws. Then there are several sacroplasty techniques. This is called a French sacroplasty, where again, if you have a high grade, high dysplastic list this is of this sort, you go in from the front, resect the L5 body, get into the disc space, and you would do an osteotomy and hinge the osteotomy anteriorly, creating a wedge shaped space. This will, and you impact the bone graft there. And this this would recontour the sacrum, and over a period of time, the sacrum recontours itself. This is one of the cases that we did in somewhere between 96 and 97, and you can see the, the type of restoration that you have achieved. Uh, SDSG type 5, I mentioned, uh, you generally prefer to do a short segment reduction and fixation. Uh, my own personal preference is to use the USS-2 instruments because the USS-2, which was marketed by the synthesis then, is a side-opening implant. It has got shan screw devices. 
Here's another example of SDSG type 5. The pelvis is unbalanced, but the spine is globally balanced. So this is the Shanskru uh, system. The Shanskru system allows you very sequential tightening, very slow sequential tightening over 30 to 40 minutes, where you can achieve almost 100% reduction in a monosegmental fashion without going to L4 at all. You don't have to expose the L4 at all, and this can be achieved. Uh, the importance, again, in all these high-grade listhesis is for the fusion. It's not so much for the reduction, but the fusion is more important. But if you have a global imbalance of this nature, then clearly that's an SDSG-6, and then you need uh, some sort of balancing mechanism which you need to go proximally, and I would choose typically to go into L4. Uh, some instances you might have to put L1 pedicle screws to give you initial distraction besides the positioning which will give you some amount of reduction. Personally, I would choose to do an L4 to S2 instrumentation as has been done in this case and you can see the sagittal balance has been restored quite well. Now, there are several indications for doing a sacral dome osteotomy. One is if you have a very rounded sacrum like this, which is very common in a high dysplastic list. This is, or if you have an angular sacrum like this, the posterior superior corner of the sacrum is very angular. There's no way you can actually access this disc space from the backside. Perhaps the easiest and simplest way to do access the disc space is to do a sacral dome osteotomy as has been depicted in this illustration. So uh, this is something that we do very often. And obviously this is done I know there are some people here who can do it minimal access, but I certainly can't even imagine doing this. So I would prefer to do that open access. So what then is the role of MIS in high-grade listhesis surgery? You have to achieve the same result as open surgery. You have to achieve the fusion. First of all, reduction when it is indicated, SDSG 5 and 6, 4, don't bother. Can I take a minute? Um, SDSG 4s, you don't bother. You can do an in-situ fixation. It doesn't matter. But if it is SDSG 5 and 6, you need to attain reduction. For reduction, you need to mobilize. Can you achieve the same amount of mobilization at you, as you would do by taking out the entire disc, taking out the same amount of facet joint, the lateral release that you would perform, and the sacral dome resection? Well, as I said, I have seen some of the lectures in the last couple of days. There are people, obviously, here who can do it very well. But a lot of people like me can't do it, so I prefer the open technique. The second thing is, can you create the sagittal realignment of the spine? The sagittal realignment involves two things, distraction and lordosization. Are you able to distract and lordosize the same way as you would do in the open? Yeah, well, if you can't do it, well and good. And the most important is fusion. You have to achieve a good quality interbody fusion in a high dysplastic list. This is, and this has to be all done with minimal risk to the patient as well as to the surgeon in terms of radiation exposure and other things. I was just looking through the literature of uh, minimally invasive procedures for high-grade listhesis. There are several papers there, and I'm really thrilled to know that a lot of these papers are from India. So this is another paper. This is one paper. This is the second paper from China, which they have uh, uh, displayed a lot of high-grade listhesis. And the very interesting thing is they have also shown, some authors have also, this is Rivolier's paper. He has actually shown that if you do a, a minimal access uh, uh, reduction and with a listhesis, the sagittal plane actually improves the, the junctional kyphosis that is seen here will actually improve. This is a very interesting finding. Other authors haven't shown that. But I must also sh tell you that Raja has written a paper a couple of years ago which says that the sagittal realignment does not matter so much. So that's food for thought for you. Does the sagittal realignment matter? My own personal take on this is for SDSG4, it does not matter because the spine is anyway well balanced. But in SDSG5 and 6, I personally believe it does matter. So you have to do a sagittal realignment. This is an interesting paper from one of our colleagues here. Uh, they have published a series of 36 cases of high-grade listhesis. What they, when they say high-grade, they have done uh, grade 2 and 3 listhesis. Seven of them in that paper is grade 3 listhesis. They haven't described the SDSG classification, but uh, they have mentioned that six of these cases are unbalanced spine, which probably means they're SDSG 5, and they have achieved a 97% fusion rate. That's fantastic. I mean, in open surgery, we get only the same amount of fusion rate. So if you've got 97% fusion rate in a high-grade listhesis with, with imbalance and SDSG 5, that's really remarkable. That's, that's a great uh, uh, achievement. So the summary of what I've been trying to tell you in the last 10 or so minutes is that remember, don't think that high grade, high dysplastic listhesis is one entity. It is not. It's a whole spectrum of diseases. A grade 3 listhesis is not the same as a grade 5 listhesis. The procedure that you're going to do for a grade 5 listhesis is not the same that you would do for a grade 3 listhesis. It's not the same. 
And also remember the treatments are completely varied in all this. At this moment, the broad guideline that we have is the SDSG classification. Perhaps that's the best to help you plan. Uh, MIS strategies are obviously feasible, but because you've heard that in the last uh, uh, one and a half days, there are several authors who are capable of doing it. But then remember that you have to achieve the same endpoint, the same fusion rate, which some of our colleagues here have been able to achieve, 97% fusion rate. Without that, whatever minimal access you do, the access-related morbidity does not count at all unless you can reach your target organ. Thank you very much indeed.